Dr. McLean is our second speaker in a series of presentations that we are hosting that are focusing on issues important to the implementation of AB 32, the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. Dr. McLean will be speaking about the experience with the acid rain and the nitrogen oxide budget programs. Dr. McLean has been with the US EPA since 1972. He is currently the director of the Office of Atmospheric Programs, which is responsible for designing and implementing emissions cap and trade programs, such as the acid rain program, for running EPA's voluntary climate protection programs, such as Energy Star, and for implementing the strategic ozone, stratospheric ozone protection programs. Dr. McLean has previously served as the director of the Clean Air Markets Division, which developed and manages the sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide trading programs and assists other countries with the development of emissions trading programs. We also have in attendance several other US EPA representatives, which I would like to welcome and thank them for coming today. Bill Irving, Senior Advisor for Climate Change in US EPA's Climate Change Division and the leader of the US Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory Team. Amy Zimfer, Associate Director of the Air Division for US EPA Region 9 and Ben Mackle, Energy Advisor for US EPA Region 9. Following Dr. McLean's presentation, there will, be a web, there will be a question and answer period. For those joining us for the presentation via webcast, you may email your questions to auditorium at calepa.ca.gov. And I just want to make folks aware, tomorrow we will be having another chair seminar detailing the UK experience in developing a national climate change policy. And we'll have several other seminars coming up. Information on these seminars can be found at the ARB seminars webpage. So please join me in welcoming Brian McLean. Thank you. Thanks. OK, it's really, it's really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, this microphone is pretty loud, too, so I can <laughs> hear myself talk. Uh, I'm going to uh, discuss with you today and, and open this up to questions, too, about the experiences we had, uh, I, I would have to say, over the last 20 years, actually developing these programs, implementing these programs, and uh, sharing with you some of those experiences, both good and bad, uh, which I think are important. Some people only tell you about what worked. I like to tell people about what didn't work. Uh, and hopefully, people won't make the same mistakes and uh, be able to develop better programs. Actually, my view is that when you embark on one of these things, you should learn as much as you can about everybody else's experiences and then sit back and decide what it is I'm really doing, what do I need to take from these programs, what should I not take from these programs, and try to es essentially come up with the, the leanest and meanest and clearest and most effective program you can. Um, so what I'm going to cover today is sort of going through both the SO2 trading program under the acid rain program and then the NOx budget program which was intended to deal with uh, ozone transport in the eastern United States. And I want to talk about both the first the problem, then the program, and then the results in each case. And many times I don't get back to the problem because it's something that we sort of dealt with 20 years ago or 10 years ago, and we sort of forget about it and we move on. But actually, it's in the nature of the problem itself and the nature of the causes of that problem that the, the design comes out of. That, in other words, we don't take a tool and just apply it to the next problem that comes along. We actually go back to what is the nature of this problem and what's the most effective and targeted way to deal with it. So looking at, at acid rain in the, in the 1980s, those of you that followed it, it was a debate in the United States for at least 10 years, uh, precipitated by a debate in Canada prior to that, and uh, they stayed with us through that decade as we looked at it. And this is a picture just as of 1990, when we were working on the Clean Air Act, of what uh, sulfate deposition, wet sulfate deposition, which is sort of the core acid rain issue, looked like in the United States. And uh, as you can see, it was not a problem in California, nor really in the western part of the United States in terms of the levels of sulfate deposition. I could also show you pictures of nitrate deposition, which are similar 
uh, but uh, a little bit different, uh, which is the sort of the second major contributor to the problem. So when we looked at this problem, uh, what we were facing was a problem primarily in the eastern United States and eastern Canada. Uh, it was um, a problem created uh, primarily by the um, uh, electric power industry, which represented about 70% of the sulfur dioxide in the United States. So we knew that this was the industry that we needed to focus on and where we needed to get reductions. And the debate was simply over how to do it. Uh, we also were dealing with a problem in acid rain, which we call a, a total loadings problem, as opposed to an ambient short-term concentration problem like we deal with with ozone or sometimes even with uh, fine particles, although some of that sort of, uh, a lot of it's annual, but there are also short-term components. Acid rain was entirely a long-term total loadings kind of problem. So it, it, it's important to know that because that made it much more amenable to the kinds of flexibilities that you might want to allow in, in developing a control strategy that you might not want to allow if you were dealing with something caused by a few sources in a localized area. So it, it opened up some possibilities for us. Um, we, let's see. We, the first thing we went about doing, and, and we went about it for several years, was saying, okay, what kind of mechanism or tools are we going to use? And, and naturally, we looked toward traditional regulatory approaches. I had done these for a long time also, and uh, we've used them in many places. California is, is a leader in many of these areas, particularly in the mobile source area, and has, has used almost every tool available to deal with the various problems that you face here. Uh, they have reduced emissions significantly. Uh, they typically focus on a technology or, or particular sources, uh, setting emission rates, uh, and they are very effective and have been very effective in many situations. But they also are very prescriptive in establishing what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, how it needs to be done. Uh, and they were often used, if we go back 30 or 40 years, when the expertise resided in the regulatory agencies that developed that understanding of the problem and the industries themselves were much less familiar with what they needed to do. Uh, in my view, over the last 30 years, the world has been changing. We have more people in government, but we also have a lot more in industry. And so there's a lot more experience and expertise there to tap into to find solutions to these problems. And as the costs go up and the solutions get more difficult, I think it's important to be able to tap into all the resources you can. So in 1989, uh, for us, the politics changed in Washington. Uh, we lost your ex-governor as president, and we gained another president. Uh, and uh, we also had a motion within the Congress over years of wanting to deal with this issue. And so I sort of describe it as the planets aligned politically. We had a president. We had a majority leader in the Senate. We had uh, continuing pressure from Canada. We had a better understanding of the nature and the science of this problem, all sort of coming together at one time, which said, let's go take care of this. And the president announced right at the beginning of his term in 89 that we were going to uh, develop acid rain legislation. We're going to develop a new Clean Air Act with, with acid rain provisions in it. And uh, we were tasked from the day after inauguration with the job of, of coming up with these solutions. We were also told at that time that it was going to be a market-based solution, uh, that the new administration decided that that was the best way to keep the cost down and the best way to, to uh, advance this issue and sort of break the log jam between regions of the country and the cost of, of dealing with this problem that had been around for 10 years. So we began looking at the tools that, that we had been using uh, as an agency and, and you've used here in California. Uh, that started in the late 70s, uh, emission bubbles, offsets, credits, credit trading, uh, which had been the market-based mechanisms that we had all had been trying out in, in to use. And we examined those also, in, in addition to the traditional approaches, and found that, uh, first of all, um, they assumed a command and control infrastructure. You started with a command and control set of situations, rate-based standards for sources, and then tried to introduce flexibility into that system. How could we reduce more here and less here and try to come up with a lower cost uh, solution to the problem? Uh, I had some experience with credit trading in the early 80s and uh, 
didn't really want to spend more time on it. It was very resource intensive. Uh, it had merit economically. I appreciated what it was trying to do, but I also saw that it w wasn't building a consensus among the various stakeholders. Uh, NGOs were generally uh, very dissatisfied, distrustful of credit trading. Uh, oftentimes the industry found it frustrating in terms of the transaction costs and the time it took uh, when they thought they came up with a good plan, but it took months sometimes to get approval for the particular plan. Um, regulatory agencies throughout, I believe states, and as well as EPA, uh, were very concerned about the credibility, whether uh, we were just moving emissions around, uh, terms like paper credits, anyway tons, uh, to describe various situations where people weren't sure of baselines and whether they're getting real reductions and, and uh, where they were occurring, plus, plus the uh, environmental consequences or the air quality consequences of actually moving emissions, there was often a need to uh, go in and do air quality modeling to make sure that the net effect was not going to be worse than the, than the current situation. All of these things uh, to ensure uh, the integrity and the... Uh, credibility of, of these systems took time and resources and, and had a cost component to it. So we generally found that even though the theory was very good, the practice was not, and that if we were going to launch a market-based system, we were going to have to address all the problems we had experienced uh, with credit and offset trading in the past. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say was when I showed the picture of where this industry was, wanted to make the comment that the utility industry we were dealing with is unique, as every industry has its unique characteristics. But in this case, the power industry is interconnected in the United States, which means regardless of the ownership of the plant, there is a, you know, a, a power pool or now an ISO uh, involved in moving that power around. And if you control one plant, it doesn't guarantee you'll get the emission reductions where you want them you may actually move production and emissions to another plant. So we were dealing with uh, basically an organic structure, a grid system that, in, that allowed uh, companies to interact uh, instantaneously in terms of power production and, and emissions. And so a solution had to take that into account. It could not assume that if we controlled it here, the controls would actually occur there. And so that was another factor and sort of the nature of the industry we were dealing with and coming up with a solution. So what we did is we sat down and looked at these programs we had used in the past, identified what was working, what was not working, and actually came up with a new approach. And it did not have a name at the time. Uh, we have since, after several years, uh, come to call it cap and trade, trying to capture sort of what was the essence of this new approach. Uh, it was an alternative to traditional regulation. It did not have some of the characteristics of traditional regulation. It, others it did. Uh, it did not have all the characteristics of credit trading. Hopefully it had some of the advantages. And it was a sort of a standalone system uh, th that would uh, operate on its own and hopefully be more efficient and effective than either of the other two. And, and particularly be effective in solving this particular problem. Uh, by by focusing in on the cost savings and making it cost effective, uh, we were building in uh, an incentive for the industry to innovate. We, uh, we made it in the industry's own interest to find innovation and lesser cost ways of doing business. Um, it encouraged early reductions and of course it encouraged cost reductions. It, it provided a, a certainty that a specific emission level would be achieved and importantly maintained. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember, and it still goes on, but in the 70s, we went through this whole process of maintenance planning, trying to figure out how could we, if we ever did attain, uh, maintain that air quality uh, into the future. And uh, I remember there were no easy solutions. And when we came up with the CAP approach, it was the first opportunity I had seen in 20 years to actually be able to say the emissions are coming down and they're going to stay down and they're not coming up. And we've internalized the growth, that if there's growth in this industry, it's going to have to find a way to absorb that growth without raising emissions. And so we had sort of pushed the problem back on to uh, the industry to find out, to find a way to, to minimize future growth in emissions. Uh, the, um, and, and I should say, it just to digress a little bit, in coming up with this cap, 
I should give a lot of credit to environmental defense in the late 80s, uh, sort of pushed this concept and actually delivered their paper to us in early 1989 as to how to go about doing this. And it had the essence of the concepts of a, a cap and trading program. Uh, what we did is we sort of took that concept, combined it with our other experiences, put in the infrastructure that we felt was going to be essential to making it a credible, workable program into the future. Uh, and EDF was also very active in the, the politics of getting this whole program through. So it was a, a combination of, uh, I would say, fathers of this uh, effort that, that produced the results we see. Um, what we also were providing here, besides this cap level, was more regulatory certainty because what we were doing is, is telling the industry for the foreseeable future, and in fact we created a permanent set of allowances so that they would know they could plan, they could build a power plant and have confidence that 20 or 30 years from now this is what the regulatory structure would be, which I admit is a very hard thing to do and doesn't work in a lot of cases, but here we had heavy, uh, had high hopes that our 50% reduction was going to be all that was necessary to deal with acid rain, so we said 50%, that's it. Uh, we were also asking for a cap. No one had ever asked for a cap before. It hadn't even been proposed in Congress before. The cap was, uh, an emission cap was equated with an economic growth cap. And it, and it was uh, um, sort of a connection that I believe we broke by the successful application of this program. But when it was passed, there were still fears that this was going to constrain economic growth in the United States. And so breaking that link was, was terrifically important and we had to give some things. One was the certainty uh, that we weren't going to change things for a, for a long time. Um, we also added, provided a lot of compliance flexibility. Uh, we lowered the permitting costs, we lowered the transaction costs. The net result was fewer administrative resources for the government and for industry. So what we tried to do was shrink the costs that essentially had nothing to do with controlling pollution but had a lot to do with the hassle factors and the costs to us and government and to industry to implement this kind of a program. And we sort of realigned responsibilities in, in uh, this area of air pollution control. We assigned to the government the job of setting goals and assuring results and enforcement. And we assigned to the industry the job of coming up with the solutions and having the flexibility to change those solutions without having to go back through government approval of every action. So we, we gave industry more flexibility than they'd had before, but we, we reaffirmed the principal roles of government in setting goals and assuring results. Uh, we also made this program compatible with the existing infrastructure. Um, we had Fortunately, at this time, almost every area in the United States attaining the SO2 ambient standard. Uh, we did not touch that program. We didn't touch uh, the way we treated new source review, uh, all those things. We left those in place, and we said what this program was going to do was reduce emissions 50%, and in no place are emissions going to rise above the standards that have already been set to protect local air quality. Uh, and so that made it different from previous credit trading where the battle had been over, well, I already have a SIP and it already tells me what the emission limits are going to be and now you're telling me if I tighten one, I can loosen the other. And that sort of opened the door to, well, then we have to remodel and we have to reassess. And we said, we're not going to go there. We're not going to remodel all the work we've done in the SIPs. We're going to leave those in place and we're going to just reduce emissions uh, throughout the country. And uh, the last thing, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll come back to this at the end, is that we lowered the costs of pollution control, which opened the door to the ability to deal with um, further environmental problems in a cost-effective way. Uh, I wanted to show you this picture of the, um, the, uh, the NERC regions in the United States. When we were crafting a solution to this problem, we recognized that most of the problem was in the eastern United States. We also knew that the West is a rapidly growing area and we didn't want the emissions to go up. So we wanted, at a minimum, we wanted a cap on emissions in, a West, in, in the West and a lowering of emissions plus a cap in the East. Um, and the way we analyzed the problem and the way we devised solutions really revolved around these electricity grid regions because this was not... Um, uh, state political issue. This where the boundary of the state was had nothing to do with where the boundary of where electricity would be uh, 
uh, distributed and, and uh, sold and where emissions would actually take place. So we analyzed this uh, following these NERC regions and, and our original proposal in 1989 was two regions, an eastern region and a western region. And the east would do what we wanted, which was reduce it and cap it, and the west would just cap it. Uh, when we did our analysis of trading across the United States, we found that there was not going to be much trading because even though the West was not going down, the cost of, of control was higher in the West because the sulfur content was already lower, scrubbers were already on most of the new plants that had been built. So your marginal cost issue was, was different. So even if you didn't reduce it in the West, your costs were not going to be that different and you were not going to see that much trading. So we ended up proposing a national program because it was simpler uh, instead of running two programs. And uh, uh, we felt that uh, you know, this would work fine and, and uh, actually administratively it might not have been that difficult to have two separate programs but it was easier to have one and that's why it became one national program. But it's not because we didn't understand there were different issues in the East and West and the emissions in the West don't really affect the East and vice versa. It was because uh, this was going to be a simpler program to operate. And so that, that's why I just wanted to mention these, these regions as being uh, important in terms of how we thought about uh, actually implementing this program. Um, the cap itself, the emission level, and allocating the allowances that would be distributed were done in the, in the legislation itself. Um, and this is different when I get to Knox where we actually did both of these things through a regulatory process. Uh, so Congress established the cap level, it established the timing of the reductions, and it also dealt with the allocations. Uh, the, it, it's important to know that the cap level was really agreed upon at the beginning of the process. When people talked about how much are we going to reduce, when are we going to reduce, this was, um, I, I wasn't even privy to this deal, but I think this was between the White House and, the, and Senator Mitchell, was sort of at the beginning of the process, it's going to be a 10 million ton reduction and it's going to go down over 10 years and that's going to be the nature of this program. And that was very important to separate those two decisions because in a cap and trade world, the battles are, are more often over the allocation than they are over the cap. And what tends to happen, as no surprise to those people working on this kind of issue, is that everyone comes in and they want their allocation raised. Nobody comes in and asks to have a lower allocation. So the consequence is that you have all these petitioners asking for increases. If you have not secured the level of the cap in the process, you're going to end up with a higher cap. And if you look at the EU ETS system, one of the problems they've encountered, because they have 25 sovereign nations, is that each country decided on its cap level. And the consequence was the whole cap was a little bit higher than it would have been had it been decided up front uh, across the whole region. And I believe they're trying to figure out how to do that because they recognize that uh, when you lose sort of control of the cap, you lose control of a lot of parts of the system in terms of the price and the reductions and everything that you're going to get. The other, the other reason you do this is when you set a cap and then you deal with the allocation secondly, uh, we had a little bit more of transparency in the allocation process. Um, if you talk to the, the folks or folk, <laughs> there were very few people involved in the Congress in doing this who had to listen to the pleadings of all the special interests, um, at least it was a semi-transparent process where if, if one senator or congressman came in and said, I need a special break for this, industry, this utility because their baseline was lower in this year, et cetera, and, and I want some spe special adjustment for them, you had to recognize that their special adjustment came at the expense of someone else. And you, you shouldn't do this in the dark. And so anyone asking for something should be able to explain it to the person they're taking it from why they're more deserving than the person who, who had them in the original allocation. And that created, uh, I think, a constructive, uh, honest tension about how these allocations were done and helped to limit uh, some of the special pleadings and, and maybe exaggerated claims because Every, you know, the petitioners will come in with a great case and you need a variety of people to poke holes in that case and say what's legitimate, what's not legitimate, how are you different or not different from somebody else. And uh, that process did go on and it, it's, a, it's a political process, it should be a political process and uh, uh, we were 
successful in getting through that to to the end. But uh, I'm I, I was participated to some degree in that. Um, so that's one of the important parts uh, about the capping first and then allocating and then distributing the allowances. We have learned uh, we have done two, three, four systems ourselves so far, and we have helped other states on allocations. We have worked with several different countries on allocation schemes, and uh, we've tried to um, characterize sort of the process that you go through in allocations. And if you talk to um, economists, there are some differences in terms of overall environmental benefit or cost between allocating and auctioning and various things. But for the most part, um, the cap is what determines the level of environmental protection and the overall costs of the program. Allocation has a big effect, though, on the distribution of, of those costs and, and the equity issues. Um, and there are many, many ways to do it. Um, we have, uh, we've done a small auction in our SO2 system. We've done direct allocations. Um, actually not using historical emissions or current emissions um, to, as some people think, but we actually used emission rates and historic energy consumption or utilization of the plants, which is slightly different than emissions. And, and I'll show you when we get to the allocations for SO2 how, how that worked out. But we call that sort of input using historically how the plant was used. Was it a baseload plant or was it a peaking plant versus output which has to do with how much electricity did it produce. And that sort of embeds some of the efficiency of the plant. So if you do it, on, if you do it historically on output, you'll, you'll give it to the plants that produce the most electricity as opposed to the plants that use the most fuel to produce electricity. So there's, there are some differences in, in uh, what messages you're sending and what rewards you're, you're providing. Uh, there, there's also... Um, uh, we also dealt with a lot of the allocation issues uh, through set-asides. We dealt with a lot of issues like renewables and, and, and uh, energy conservation by, by setting aside some allowances and rewarding them, uh, awarding them, I should say, to people who undertook those measures. Um, we had, uh, we've had in other programs new source set-asides because new sources feel they're discriminated against if they get no allowances at all. Um, so uh, our NOx program has new source set-asides, the SO2 program does not, and then there are many different combinations. There's also an issue of whether you, you give these allocations out permanently and don't change them, or whether you update them every five or ten years to recognize uh, shifts in, in mix of, of industry. Uh, but as I say, the bottom line is that the cap and, and whether you have banking uh, tends to drive where, when and where the reductions occur and the costs and benefits of the program for the most part. Um, this is um, how the allocations were done for SO2. Uh, we had phase one that focused it on a subset of plants. They a actually were about 10% of, of the plants and they emitted about 50% of the emissions. Uh, and they were all the highest emitting largest plants in the United States. And we set a rate at 2.5 pounds times the heat input. What that meant is if a plant had a 6 pound rate, it was going to get a very significant cut in its allowances. If it emitted at 2.5 pounds, it was going to get what it emitted. So that's why I say it wasn't exactly what people emitted in the baseline. There was an accounting for uh, performance level to try to equalize. In phase two, that was reduced to 1.2, so anybody emitting over 1.2 got less allowances than they emitted. Uh, below 1.2, we tended to keep it at what they were emitting at with a 20% increase, so they, they had some growth margin, but uh, not significant. And then in the course of the legislative process, Congress added about, we call, over 20 sites situation specific things. They either covered individual companies or states or and, and I'll show you some of them were like um, clean plants in high growth states. So the West got more allocations, Florida got more allocations. Florida had the best congressional delegation going. Uh, they got four or five special allocations for the state of Florida. They were the highest growth state, etc. And so Actually, what it turned out at the end of the day, they had excess allowances that they had to sell. They got so many. 
But uh, that's, it, it, as I say, it didn't affect the cap and it didn't affect the overall program, but it was an equity distribution issue. Uh, we have an auction at now about 2.8% of the allowances every year. Uh, uh, as I said, new sources don't get any allocation. So essentially it's like a new source standard of zero and they have to buy their way into the program. Uh, we had a set aside for selling allowances, but it was a set aside from within the cap. In other words, you, you couldn't just buy them and increase the size of the cap. We had pulled some out and made them available. Uh, the price turned out to be a little bit higher than anybody wanted to pay and the market appeared to work, both of which we did not know when we started the program. And this program was never used. Uh, we never made direct sales uh, of allowances. And we uh, got rid of the program after three years, which we were allowed to do. Um, the, the second area I wanted to, to mention, which I think is actually, with the cap, is the most important aspect of this program because with the cap and with the accounting of all the emissions, everything else is possible. If you don't have the cap and you don't have a solid accounting of emissions, then everything else is much more complicated. Uh, and we were driving to be as simple a, a program as we could with as few resources to run it. And so we worked really hard to maintain the cap and to maintain the, uh, the monitoring requirements in the program. Uh, we wanted to account for every ton of emissions without any us underestimation of emissions. This was our guarantee that this program was going to produce the environmental results it set out to. We tried to keep it as simple and most importantly as consistent across uh, facilities and, and states in the whole country and keep the process very transparent. We had incentives for accuracy and improvement. What we did was as if monitors were down uh, if they're down for an hour, we just use the hour before and after for their emissions. But if they were down eight hours or a day, we started uh, increasing the conservativeness of the estimate for the emissions we plugged in. And we knew that we were overestimating -esti emissions. The sources knew it. But the purpose was to incentivize them to keep the monitors running and to do, do their job in terms of, of operating that aspect of the program. We have had... Uh, 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 monitor availability over 99%. Um, when we started this program, the industry said it couldn't be over 70%. Um, we compromised at 90%, and now it's turned out to be 99%. So uh, that that's proved to have worked out. Um, uh, th th it's the costliest part of the program, but it's a very small cost of the program relative to the total savings. Uh, and it was it was fought because because it was a cost. Um, uh, but I argued internally before we submitted this to Congress that that was the key. And if we couldn't credibly say what the emissions were, having been through emissions trading before, that this program was not going to fly and and it was going to be criticized and it would it would not be the success that the proponents wanted. But if we were able to show and demonstrate exactly what every plan emitted any time that people wanted to know that data, we would have a really solid, credible base for uh, operating this program. And I uh, won that debate within the administration. It went to the Hill, and it was never changed because to Congress, monitoring was too complicated, And uh, I believe. So they left that alone, and, and that became a really core part of the program. We introduced some flexibility in it because we recognized that you know, one brief one-size-fits-all program could be expensive. So for plants that did not use coal, we gave them some options. I mean, gas and oil is pretty uh, homogenous fuel, and, and there are alternatives to continuous emission monitors. And so you can see that we accounted for 96% of the SO2 through CEMs, uh, which was only two-thirds of the plants, actually, um, that use a full suite of CEMs. And we have electronic reporting and feedback. And I know in parts of California, you have electronic real-time reporting. We decided we did not need real-time reporting. Again, this is a total loadings annual program, so we could afford to collect it every three months and not, at, and not instantaneously, at, because that wasn't the nature of the problem. Um, we have pretty strict quality assurance and verification of these emissions by EPA, and we work with our regions and with state offices as part of the normal process of uh, inspecting and, and ensuring compliance of plants with all the other requirements of the Clean Air Act. This becomes a small 
part of the overall compliance picture. But if you're out there at the plant, you know, go check the monitors and make sure that the data is correct, uh, the records are correct. Um, I mentioned the conservative data substitution that we use to provide an incentive for plants. Uh, we now do uh, almost 100% electronic audit of every plant, of every uh, piece of data that's submitted. Uh, the Internet's a beautiful thing. Uh, it didn't exist in full form when we started this program 15 years ago, and we've taken advantage of advances in, in IT. Uh, and as I say, we do random on-site field audits and, and witnessing QA tests. This is the most complex part of the program. Part of the complexity is the options we give. So the rule would not be as complicated if we told everybody to do one thing, but we, we do give them some flexibility. Um, as I said, we have the electronic reporting, and we give them instant feedback on the data quality, uh, at least uh, from what we can check quickly uh, before we do other audits on the data. Um, the other thing that we added, which, which I hadn't seen in, the, in, in national air programs before this, was public access to the hourly emissions data. And you can go on our web and get every hour's worth of data from every power plant in the United States, every boiler uh, in the United States, um, which I felt now answered a question that I had seen for years where uh, the planning people went out and did an inventory in order to do SIP planning. Uh, the modelers went out and did their own inventory to do air quality modeling because whatever the SIP planners did wasn't sufficient for the air quality modelers. And then the enforcement people went out and did their own inventory. And uh, you know, I said, wouldn't it be easier if we had one inventory that had as, as exact data as we could for this source, could be used for planning, could be used for regulatory programs, could be used for modeling, could be used for enforcement. And that's what we have now with, with power plants. Um, and, and we run it, um, you know, it probably consumes 20 or 30 EPA staff and uh, portions of state staff, as I say, as they contribute to this, and it's well worth the investment. Um, turning to the allowance part of the program, uh, we created an allowance registry. We started working with banks and tried to do you know, accurate double check, triple check of this because here we were dealing with financial assets, essentially, and we had never done that before. Um, and we hired uh, consultants who did work for banks. So it was, uh, you know, that was the foundation of the integrity of the allowance system. But it is a registry. It's not a trading platform. We don't actually trade allowances. We just record them. We're more like the title agent for the ownership of these allowances. And uh, in the late 90s, we, we uh, made this available online. And because of the cap and because of the monitoring, um, and because of the way the program is set up, we do not review any of the trades uh, there's no way they can create credits. Uh, they're fixed in number. And we, um, uh, we allow people to transfer them online. Um, we also make this data available so anybody can see who's traded with anybody else because my experience had been with emissions trading that there was a lot of suspicion about where these were going, who owned them, what they were doing with them. And that's available. You can track every allowance through the system. It's serialized. So uh, you know where it's been, who has it, and now that we do it, nobody cares about it. But, <laughs> but it was a, you know, an appropriate thing to do to provide that assurance that this was, was not a mystery and it wasn't a secret, uh, and we should know where all of these things are. And people have come to recognize that the real issue is what the plan emits, not what it owns in the bank. It, it depends on what it actually uses. Um, we also have, as part of our program, environmental accountability, which we built in at the beginning of the program. I had been in the air program for over 15 years, and, I, and it was always like nobody could afford it. Uh, it was always what you wanted to know was how the program was working, but nobody had the resources or the time to, to go check. Because this we had spent 10 years doing science on this program, and, and because we were doing trading, which made people nervous, uh, I felt that an, an incredibly important part of the program was to be able to provide public accountability for what was happening, the trading, but also what was the environmental consequence and what was the environmental consequence of the trading itself. So on the left, you see um, those are um, deposition monitors across the country. Um, there are over 200 wet and about 60 or 70 dry deposition monitors. 
uh, on the right is uh, what now we do for what's called the long-term monitoring, surface water monitoring, uh, which uh, you know, 15 years ago covered more of the country, but uh, we all understand resource constraints, and so it's gotten smaller and smaller, and so we had to keep prioritizing and reprioritizing and focus on the areas with most sensitive acid deposition problems that are affected by these emissions. So a combination of deposition and sensitivity dictated where um, the air quality monitoring goes, uh, the water quality monitoring goes. And so we, uh, we also keep and track that and report on, on results. Um, this just shows sort of geographically, you can see where the emissions are in the United States. I mean, there are not a lot of SO2 emissions in the West outside of Texas. Um, and that's the reason there's not a lot of sulfate deposition. But you also can see the left bar is 1990, if you can see it, and then, and then it drops off in 95, 2000, 2005, uh, for the most part, under this program. Um, this is a map which you know, you'd have to look at very closely, but the point was we tracked every power plant, whether its emissions went up or down, where they were, and of course, they did not. All, one of the fears was that there would be geographic shifts. In part of the country, the emissions would come down, and in another part, they would go up, and we'd be creating environmental problems. Again, the, the trading scenario. Um, this did not happen. The the increases, uh, which are the um, squares, uh, are scattered throughout the country, and the consequence is that there are also reductions that are occurring near most of the increases. So. For a regional problem, this, this gets averaged out, and you don't see um, the creation of problems that, that people had feared. We also have looked at where did the reductions occur by size, and this is sort of a scatter plot here. The, the line uh, shows the overall reduction in uh, emissions uh, by size of plant, and the blue dots are the individual plants. And you can see when plants get over about 150, 180,000 tons, of SO2, they've all it reduced their emissions. Where we've seen increases which do not exceed SIP limits, but there are some increases that are allowed within the SIP limit, uh, they tend to be at the smaller plants. And that's another reason that we don't see um, hot spots in the region because the largest plants were going down and the smaller plants were mixed in amongst those and we, we did not see the, the effect of that. Um, we've had the hot spot issue analyzed by the Environmental Law Institute, uh, Resources for the Future, and EDF over the years. They've independently looked at the issue of hotspots and have concluded that there are none. In fact, RFF concluded there were cooling effects because of the reductions occurring where we had the biggest plants and we had the biggest uh, impact on deposition. So we actually got bigger reductions in the areas where we had the highest uh, levels of deposition because of the, nat the economic nature of the program and, and where it drove people. Uh, so this is a picture of sort of before and after. Um, as I say, we keep track of the, the deposition and uh, it's definitely down. So this, this is monitoring on the ground, it's not modeling. Uh, so we can, we can look at the emissions, uh, we can model it, and we can also look at the monitored data. So we, we cross-check across these things and make sure that nobody's cheating. If people were not actually lowering their emissions, we wouldn't be seeing the deposition reductions. Um, we also learned through this process and everything we've done that we did not reduce enough, and, and uh, I'll get to that. We get, did a 50, almost a 50% reduction of power plant emissions which is what everybody thought at the time would be sufficient to solve the problem, and it turned out not to be. Um, the allowance market itself, which many people are interested in and we track, we, we designed a system that was, would be able to handle as many allowance transfers, many trades, as people wanted to make. We wanted to remove ourselves as an obstacle to trading, uh, and that's, that's the, way, the nature of the program and the way it was set up. Um, to date, since we started tracking allowance transfers, there have been over 200 million allowances transferred, over 43,000 transactions. Um, they're up to about you know, five or 6,000 a year now. Uh, and now we do 98% of the transfers are handled online. We originally did it with paper transfers and typing it in, uh, but we moved as we could to online transfers, which means I basically have 
you know, a fraction of a person who keeps track of the allowances. At the end of the year, two or three people get together and, and do the accounting for the system. And it reduced the transaction costs to virtually zero for government-imposed transaction costs and reduced the cost to industry to do this. And, and that was one of our goals, was to, to make this trading program not only to save money on the compliance side, but also to make it as efficient as possible on the administrative side of, of the program and having no effect on the, um, on the environmental uh, results from the program. Um, allowance prices, we, we do not track ourselves, but we track them through a, a broker, several brokerages. This is a Cantor Fitzgerald market price index. Um, and so we, we borrow their index. We decided in the beginning of the program we did not need to track price because we were environmental regulators and we didn't really care. We cared indirectly because we wanted the program to work, but we didn't care directly what the price of an allowance was. Uh, it, originally, it was supposed to be in the, you know, less than $200 in phase one and go up to six, $700 in phase two. The price uh, stayed below $200 for many, many years. Uh, in 2004, the price started to rise, as you can see. And this was when we introduced the clean air interstate rule, which will cut emissions by another 70%. Um, I, I felt what this said to us, we, we introduced the Clear Skies Act, which would cut emissions 70%, and we introduced that in 2002, and you see no impact from introducing legislation. I just thought I'd point that out. Um, so for four years, the market did not react to the introduction of legislation, but when we introduced regulations, somehow we had more credibility, <laughs> and the market reacted and the price started going up. We also had more institutional players, financial players, jumped in uh, last year, um, banks like Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan, and, and they were new to the game and they started buying them up thinking the allowance prices were going to go up. We said they shouldn't go up that high. Um, the cost of compliance was going to be more in the $600 to $800 range. Um, $1,600 seemed to be a little outrageous. Um, finally, that got to people. Markets tend to overshoot, and it has come down. It's closer to $500 today, uh, which is closer to where it ought to be. Um, the cost of the program, uh, we estimated it in 1990. Uh, EEI did their own estimates and, of course, thought it would be more expensive. Um, this is uh, done in 2006 dollars, so at the time it was like three to five billion dollars, but if, if you do it in 2006 dollars, it's seven to eight billion dollars. Um, a couple years ago, we reevaluated it and the cost was around two billion dollars. And that basically, that, that's been one of the successes. Now, there were a lot of reasons for that, and I can go through that if people have questions. In fact, before I go to the Knox trading program, I thought I could pause at this point and ask if there are any specific questions about sort of the SO2 trading program and issues that I may have missed or mentioned that you wanted clarified. Yes? Okay. Oh. Hi. What are the environmental results right now as we speak today? Are they, what's the, since that's the original aim. Right. The, um, the emissions are down to around 10 million tons from a level of over 17 million from the utility sector. The, um, the, uh, and the, the sulfate deposition is the main thing we were focused on because the purpose of it was acid rain. Now, the, the real benefits are in the public health benefits from reduction of fine particles. And so we just reevaluated it uh, last year. There was a paper published uh, by an economist. Uh, and uh, the cost, the, the benefits of the program are at $122 billion projected for 2010. I mean, most of it's there now because the reductions are almost down to that level. Uh, Nine million tons is the level, and there are about ten now. So it's we're we're seeing most of the benefits of the program from a public health perspective, and uh, these are the environmental benefits. And what I said is that now that we've seen these sulfate levels, and we've checked the streams, we have seen some improvements uh, in um, in lakes and streams in the northeast, but we're not seeing improvements in the southeast. 
And that's why we proposed another 70% reduction of SO2 and NOx to deal with remaining acid rain concerns as well as fine particle concerns. So um, the results are very good. Uh, they are what they are. And, uh, you know, it's one of the highest, highest cost-benefit ratios of any program in the government. Um, so that, that's pretty good I, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Um, wasn't your uh, 10 million ton reduction though kind of thought out ahead of time with technology? In other words, you knew going in that with the 2.5 pounds per million BTU and the 1.2 pounds per million BTU over 25 know, megawatts, right. in which you could make and get to 10 million tons reduction. Yes. Okay. Um, that's, that's a little bit different than uh, coming up with an arbitrary number totally out of the box. Um, a la like what's here, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know, on CO2, trying to go back to an arbitrary number of 1990. You actually put the horse before the cart. Right. Right? <laughs> so you've, Just trying so to you, follow that one. Okay. Now, the, uh, the other thing I was asking about, on your plants that are running now, baseload and that, you know, whatever, how are they running? Are there allowances based on the uh, technology performance standard or are they based on an annual emissions? And especially the reason why I state is you know running plants, sometimes they'll run a few more hours in a year. Right. Okay, and that, so that's the one thing, I, that's the second part of the question is, is it still just based, in other words, if that plant meets the technology standard, are you okay? No, uh, or do you look at uh, the? It's it's based on allowances. We we calculate based on data that existed in the mid '80s as to how that plant was used. You know, if it's a baseload plant and it ran 80 percent of the time, we put in the BTUs at an 80 80 percent level and set the emission rate at 1.2 pounds, and that became its al its allowance allocation. If they ran the plant at 90 percent, they'd have to buy allowances, to, or they'd have to control the plant. So, in other words, we set a permanent level based on historical information that seemed to be fair and appropriate, but would not guarantee that they had enough allowances to operate the plant any way they wanted to. If they used it more uh, beyond that, they were going to need to buy allowances. If they used it less or controlled it, they would have allowances to sell. Okay, so in other words, you, uh, a few more hours they operate, they have to go and buy some right. offsets right. in order to make that. My last question is this. If you would have, let's say, just pu pushed for performance standards, in other words, the 1.2, or maybe right. even go to, you know, 1.2 is, you know, is 1.2% uh, sulfur coal, right? Right. Okay. Supposing that you would have come out with something like 1% and forget about all this offsets, right. would you have been just as good or even possibly better off? Well, you know, one of the bills. All the bills in Congress prior to this, during the 90s, were based on that premise of setting some kind of emission rate, applying it to all the plants, setting rates for new plants, and then, you know, letting the system go. Um, my experience was that as long as this economy grows and that industry grows, the emissions are going to grow. I mean, transportation, we keep ratcheting down the rates and people keep driving more, and so we have to keep ratcheting down the rates. So. Uh, this was an attempt to say, let's get out of this game where we have to come back in every few years, depending on growth rates, and ratchet down the rate. Why don't we just leave it up to the industry and say, look, our goal is that these emissions go down, stay down. If you want to grow, it is fine. You know what the game is. You know that if you're going to grow 50%, you're either going to have to buy allowances or become more efficient or put controls on. You can put that into your long-range planning. You can put that into all your corporate planning. And now we've allowed you to integrate that. We're not going to come back five years later after you've done your corporate planning and built your plan and say, oh, by the way, we need to reduce your rate. And then they would say, well, I wish you'd told me that five years ago. I would have built a different plant. So what we were trying to do was give industry the, the clarity and certainty they needed to put that into their corporate planning and decision making so that they wouldn't be surprised and we wouldn't have this battle every few years about now I've got to go back and do this.
um, we wanted to tell new plants, you know, like you can mit at the NSPS or you can mit at BACT or you can emit at LAIR, but we're not giving you any allowances. I mean, if you want, it, it, that drove you to be the cleanest possible plant. So it was a, it was a trade off. And uh, for the certainty, you would have to take more responsibility for doing the planning and incorporating this information into your decision making. So that if a person mapped the LAIR number, right. which is back in the out here at the PAC, if right. they met that, then they didn't have to worry about allowances. Is that right? No, they'd have to buy allowances. If it's a new plant, if you built a new plant today, a new power plant today, you would get no allowances. And so no matter how clean it is, whatever you emit, you're going to have to cover with allowances. That's the way the program was set up. Uh, as I said, when I get to Knox, people said, well, that's a little too harsh. Let's have a set aside for these new plants. Even if they're clean, let's give them allowances at the lowest rate, but give them something because we're giving them to somebody else. And that's an equity issue about how you treat new and old plants. One of the reasons we were able to do this for the utility sector is that for the most part, uh, this was in the 80s, think of it as a regulated world, um, most plants were being built by companies that already existed, that already had plants. There were some merchant plants, but for the most part, it was an industry that was building its own plants. So they would just reduce emissions and an existing plant to provide it to the new plant they were building. You know, so they would do internal offsets. So that's the reason it wasn't as big an issue as it could have been. The second reason was going into the 90s, nobody was building coal plants. They were building gas plants, which emit virtually no SO2. So we had a... Uh, a, a fortunate situation that we were entering into. Now what's happening is coal plants are coming back. People want to build coal plants. We're going to see more like, hey, you're not giving me any allowances and I'm building a coal plant. But the technology has improved too and we can make coal plants 99% clean. So the amount of allowances they need is a relatively small part of the cost of building and operating that plant. So, but it's known. It's a known thing, and my experience has been with industry is the first thing they want to know is certainty. The second thing is they would like it to be as least expensive as possible. But the uncertainty, they build in factors to account for what they don't know. So we have efficiencies built into our economy for every uncertainty we create. So that was part of it. To your first question about the technology, just to amplify on that. I, it is true that when we did this program, in fact, almost every program we've done in air pollution control in, in, in my lifetime, we have had some idea of how to get there. We have at least one technology that'll do it. Uh, it may cost a lot, but we sort of know that it can be done. It can physically, technically be done or very, very close to being done. I mean, we go back to the 70s with catalytic converters and the battles that went on in the mid-70s over it. But they did exist and they were being driven. It was just our industry said, we, we don't know how to build them. But I mean, there was that debate over whether it was there or not there. Um, and you're correct. In some of the climate areas, if you wanted to make a tremendous reduction, we don't have the technologies to provide a tremendous reduction. Uh, but we do have technologies that will provide some of that reduction. So the debate is not over whether there's anything or nothing. It's how much there is and when will it be available. And so it's, it's a more nuanced debate. But um, it's true for command and control as well as for this program. We had a pretty good idea of what was available. The issue was over cost. This is too expensive. And that's what we tried to do is lower the cost. Hi, uh, Rafael Aguilar with Environmental Defense. Um, question on the emissions modeling that you did. Yeah. Just uh, wondered if you factored in costs of compliance or was Tony's question, sort of the ideas you might have had with the cost of compliance and uh, whether or not the result, which you have up on the screen there, was, was uh, accurately predicted. Hmm. Well, we had cost. We had, we analyzed everything. I mean, <laughs> We, we, we did the science, we did the economics, uh, and I think this, this is pretty close to what we predicted. That what, what we didn't know was really more in the science, in watersheds, and if we reduced deposition to this level, would that be sufficient to stop acidification of lakes and streams? And that, that's where the science was most uncertain. The atmospheric science was a lot better than the um, soil science and the watershed science. So I think that's that's where 
you know, it was new ground, no pun intended with <laughs> soil science. But um, it, 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 was, it was a new area for us, and those models have improved over the last 10 years, 15 years, and uh, we feel more confident about what levels of reductions we need. And we have modeled them, and the truth is, even with a 70% reduction, we see a lot of the problems in the northeast going away, but again, in the southeast, with different soil types, uh, all we're doing is stopping uh, deterioration. Uh, we're not able to reverse it at, the, at those levels. We probably have to go further. Adrian Candell at California Energy. This is about the um, idea of just the cap affecting the level rather than whether it's auctioned or given. And you've probably thought this through. I wonder your thoughts on how this applies in, in a field like greenhouse gas where there are things such as gasoline use or some of the fossil fuels that no matter what, you just can't scrub it clean. And so if the owner of the plant is given the emissions, they don't have to raise the price of their service. But if, say, the gasoline pumps or the oil pumpers at the ground in the first place or anywhere along that distribution, they have to buy rights, they end up with essentially a carbon tax that shows up at the pump that mm -hmm. depresses demand, which might create a kind of path dependence where people are perhaps building lifestyles, cities, or whatever around less use of that. Um, and if that changes the fact or not that your, your view that the total cap, actually it doesn't matter who allocates in, in the ultimate use or how it's allocated. Yeah, you're <laughs> there, there are a lot of different issues there. I, what I was trying to clarify is that the level of the cap is the dominant consideration there are equity concerns and behavioral responses to where those costs are and how they flow through the system. Uh, I, I'm not an economist, so I can not speak as brilliantly as one would about it's all the price signal and it doesn't matter how you get the price signal and people behave a certain way given a certain price. And then people argue about what level that needs to be to cause what kind of behavior. But if you're talking about a system where you where you put allowances on the upstream side and you let them pass through as a price, it, is, it behaves exactly like a tax would behave because all the consumer or the user sees is a price difference and they don't know how it got there and it doesn't really matter to them and their behavior and response will be basically on the price they see, not on the way the price got there. Um, and, they can, and they can do nothing but uh, you know, take that into account in their personal economics and if they either drive less or, or spend less on something else, that's what the economic models will tell you, sort of how people will respond to that price signal in, in one sector. And then the, the, the issue with climate, of course, is that it affects so many different sectors or it can affect so many se different sectors in terms of how you implement a program that you have to put all of that into a model and see, given all these different price Im implications, how do consumers and industry behave in response to that, that price signal? Um, trading is a little different in my mind because, because maybe I talk to brokers in industry and people think they can actually make money in the system. Whereas in a tax, it's just how much do I lose? But, uh, but it, it's supposed to have the same effect, I've been told. Although when I talk to people who get really excited about making money by reducing their emissions and selling the rights, it, it is different from people who just talk about a cost. Anyway, I thought maybe I'd just go on with the, the Knox program here so I can cover this and point out some of the differences. The, the first thing is the nature of the problem was different. So when Knox started ozone, regional ozone in the eastern United States, a multi-state issue uh, was coming up in, in the early mid-90s. Uh, you know, we were facing a different kind of problem and the question was, would this mechanism that we were just in the process of adopting and developing and putting in place for SO2 work in the ozone world? And I, I was skeptical, uh, having worked in ozone and transportation and other issues uh, regarding ozone in the past, and I knew, well, first of all, it's a short-term concentration. We're concerned about one hour at that time and now eight-hour concentrations. It's not a total loadings issue. It's very important what happens on a daily basis. Um, 
you know, a, a trading program, uh, a large trading program, how is that going to play into this problem? Is it going to be an assist in solving it? Uh, is it, you know, not going to be very helpful? Uh, but we sort of broke the, the ozone problem down into uh, vaguely a local component and a transport component. We discovered that in the eastern U.S., a lot of the background levels of ozone, and now with fine particles, the same issue, uh, that in many cities, uh, over half the problem is not caused by anything near the city. It's regional or it's, it's out of state, other states. And when half your problem is not something under your control, then uh, we started looking at mechanisms that could assist states in attaining those standards so they could focus on the part they could control and that we would help them contribute by reducing the background or the transport level going in. So the purpose of this ozone program, this NOx reduction uh, for the NOx budget program, was not uh, to solve the daily peaks going on in urban areas. It was to lower the background level of ozone coming into the area or being created in the area by lowering the background level of, of nitrogen oxide, the transport level. And that's important because a lot of people look at the results and then they say, oh, well, you didn't change the peaks. Well, that wasn't the point. The point was, did we lower the, the overall levels of NOx and ozone in the region? And that would define success for this program. So as long as you define what you're doing correctly, then you can measure whether you did it, that's fine. But um, not to change the definition sort of midway through. The, the other difference here is that our source categories were quite different. SO2, 70% utilities was pretty straightforward where to go. Here, you know, power generation was 30% or less, industry 20% or so, vehicles 40, 50%. So it's a different mix and it's, you know, you face it here all the time. So you know you're dealing with a different mix of sources. Could we also apply this here as effectively? Well, it, we weren't going to apply it to vehicles and we were going to start with utilities and we were able to add maybe half the industrial emissions through industrial boilers, we're still dealing with maybe 30%, 40% of the problem. So it was not, again, going to be as effective because we weren't attacking as much of the problem. Uh, it started in the Northeast. The Ozone Transport Commission was created under the 1990 amendments, which bound those states, 12 states, 11 states, and the District of Columbia together to try to figure out to deal with ozone transport in the Northeast. Uh, uh, basically the Amtrak corridor from Washington to Boston. Um, and uh, later, th these other states were brought in as we began to understand the problem better. In the beginning, uh, the Ozone Transport Commission got together in 1994, four years, uh, three years or so after the act was passed, and signed an MOU among the states saying that we were they were going to deal with the stationary source portion of this through a cap and trade program. At that time they called it a NOx budget program. Uh, to set a level of NOx emissions, reduce that level, and allow for trading within the region. Uh, but they didn't have any detail to that. Um, in 1996, after the year after SO2 proved to be very successful, we didn't get the first results until 95, we we're now in a position to say, you know, this seems to work and it was a lot better than we thought and maybe it could work. Um, and I, I went up and visited with the chair, chairman of the uh, OTC at the time, was the New Jersey Commissioner, Bob Shin, and I explained how we ran the SO2 program and, and said, I know you're trying to do the same thing. You're going to create 10 registries in 10 states. You're going to have 10 different monitoring rules, uh, and you're going to set 10 different caps. And how are you going to make this all work as a region? And they knew this was going to be difficult. And I said, well, look, why don't we do this together? Why don't we give you or help you by doing the tracking of the allowances and the emissions, setting up a central registry so there'd be one trading regime, uh, work with you on a monitoring rule so there'd be one consistent, consistent set of monitoring requirements, and then you assign what level of cap you want for the region, what, how you want to allocate that cap or partition it across the states, how each state wants to allocate it to its sources. In other words, you take care of the policy issues that are pertinent to your states. We'll take care of the mechanics of operating the system and simplifying it so you don't have to recreate the wheel. And essentially, we reached an agreement. I don't think we ever signed it. It was just sort of an informal handshake agreement that we would do that. And we went ahead and basically modified our 
tracking systems to be able to handle it. They added more sources. They added industrial sources, and they added smaller utility sources down to 15 megawatts. Uh, so it, it increased the number of sources that we had to handle in the system, but it was basically an agreement that we would do it together. And I don't recall of another sort of federal-state partnership where we actually implemented a program together doing pieces of it that we felt were appropriate that we could handle. Um, this sort of shows the early years. That program started in 1999, ran until 2003. Uh, emissions came down in 1995 because under the acid rain program we were reducing NOx and they were doing controls in, in their states also. So we got a big chunk of NOx reductions in 95 and then the cap was set to pull it down further. And as you can see, they set the budget level and the emissions came in under that. Um, the, um, the unique things about this was that they added industrial boilers and turbines and process heaters. Which, So we had originally been dealing just with utilities. Now they brought in another sector uh, that could be amenable to uh, a trading program. Um, and... Uh, and at the beginning, there were some rough spots, and I can go through prices, uh, you know, shot up in the months before the first season. And in fact, every program I've been involved in, there's price volatility at the opening of the program. And fortunately, for whatever reasons, they've all settled down, and, and it's been fine, and we haven't changed the program or, you know, altered it in any significant way. Um, We then moved on to the, the Knox SIP call, which was a recognition in the mid-90s, even as the OTC was moving, that the region wasn't large enough. That that part of the Northeast, even though they had these non-attainment problems, again, they were not of their own making, and a large component of it was coming from the Midwest and the Southeast, and that we were going to have to deal with that. And we had a two-year process with 35 states. Um, California, fortunately, didn't have to be involved, but Texas and on up were involved in this process. Um, and they made some proposals, a range of proposals. They couldn't agree on a final uh, system. But the most stringent one we took, proposed and enacted and promulgated as a, as a rule. And, and the SIP call meant we called for SIP revisions in um, 22 states. It ended up being 19 states in D.C., I think, by the time we were finished. Um, and it was a complex process, and it was a regulatory one, and we got litigated. And we won the litigation, and the critical part of the litigation was we basically were interpreting the Clean Air Act to give EPA the authority to work with a group of states to set an overall budget, to allocate it to states and allow them to work out the problem, giving them some discretion in what they did so we weren't dictating it completely, but we were providing enough of a framework that they could move forward, and we succeeded with that. And the, the result is that it, it gave us essentially the authority to use this kind of a mechanism in the future, which we have just used in the last two years, which is um, to, to do this clean air interstate rule. Um, so we defined the problem here as reducing NOx from electric generators and industrial boilers by a million tons, or 70 percent below the 1990 levels, in the summertime, five-month summer season. There were a number of new sources added, so the universe of sources was almost the same size as the acid rain program. Um, the federal role in this program was a little stronger than it was when I worked out this deal with the OTC because we took on a little bit more responsibility to make this happen in the East because this wasn't as voluntary. In the OTC, they were all together and wanted to do this. When we expanded it, there was a little more reluctance as you moved into the Midwest and the Southeast. So we needed a little bit more uh, authority here. We set the budgets for the states as opposed to waiting for them to come to agreement on them. Uh, we based it on data. We, set, uh, we, we, we came up actually with allocations and aggregated them, gave it to the state and let them reallocate as they chose. We came up with a model trading rule, which they had the choice of adopting or they could go their own way through a traditional regulatory approach. And we said we would administer the emission and allowance tracking systems. The states had the responsibility to decide if they were going to join this program or not. That was the flexibility that the court sort of essentially was saying we had to give the states. And uh, in the end, they all, they all entered the system. Uh, that they would, they would work with their sources, they would allocate the allowances, um, 
and uh, they would be responsible for compliance and enforcement uh, within the states. And uh, we litigated that, and a couple states are coming in in 2007, but most of them are in in 2004. Um, and so this sort of identifies who this applies to, um, electric generators, industrial boilers over 250 million BTU, uh, how we distributed and allocated the allowances. Uh, different states took different approaches, so they have some states have set-asides for new sources, others don't. Some allocate for four or five years at a time, some one or two years at a time. So there's some differentials, and every differential creates some level of cost in the trading system because it creates some uh, differential that the market has to accommodate. And you know, my view is, uh, you know, it's not the end of the world, but why do they? Why do you need those differences? Because they're only costing your taxpayers more money. I mean, they're not affecting the overall emissions. They're not affecting attainment of the standards. They're all economic issues. And, uh, you know, from an environmental perspective, I, I don't think we should be adding unnecessary costs to the system. We should be focusing on getting the environmental benefits at the lowest cost we can. Um, they came up with the bottom point here as progressive flow control, they called it. Now, this is to deal with the temporal nature of ozone. The concern was here, the same concerns you had in the South Coast, was that because of the temporal nature, if people had allowances and they banked them, they might use them all on the hottest day and emissions would rise and concentrations would be exceeded and we'd have a problem. And that's a legitimate concern. And the solution was that uh, if you collected too many, banked too many allowances, you would have to start using them at two for one. So, you, so it was a disincentive to create a big bank. It was supposed to be a disincentive to use the bank, but it also is a disincentive to create it. Um, and so you have this, there's a trade-off here. There's a little loss of, of economic efficiency for a, a, a perceived problem. And uh, we did not think that this was going to make a big difference either way. Uh, and we went ahead and put it in the rules because this is what the states collectively wanted to do. Uh, and we have, we have run it with this. But what it does is it creates a differential for every year of allowances. They each have a different value. And so the market is very split. In other words, with SO2, there's one price for an SO2 allowance. Everywhere in the country, any time, any year, well, they're, 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 the market creates a differential thing, but it's not because we created a differential. In Knox, there's a different price for every year's worth of allowance, depending on whether they think they're going to be more or less in a given year, and whether the bank's going to be bigger, and whether this is going to kick in, and all that. So you have a lot more differentiation, you have less activity, and you probably have higher transaction costs as a result. But it was, it was done for a, a, a legitimate purpose. Uh, we used the same monitoring pretty much that we used for acid rain, modified it a little bit. Uh, the compliance and enforcement in this program in acid rain, there was a dollar penalty as well as a surrender. In this case, because it was multiple states and they couldn't get this through all their legis legislative bodies, they went with a, uh, an allowance surrender formula because uh, they could agree on that and they didn't have to go for legislation. So it would be three allowances for every ton you're over. So it was, it was to create, a, obviously, a penalty and one that was equitable across the region. So they went for allowance surrender rather than, uh, than a dollar penalty. Um, this shows the emission reductions from 1990 on the left to 2000. Uh, and you can see the drop in the Northeast in 2000 because their program went into effect and it was coming down also because there are some other programs going into effect and then it drops heavily in 04 and 05 uh, in these areas. I wanted to show you this chart because, in the, at, well, first of all, the top, from, since 1990 through 2005, the NOx emissions in the ozone season in this region dropped 72%. The goal was 70%. So uh, we've essentially gotten there. Um, and it, it's been, I mean, it's remarkable. I've been in this area a long time and get reductions like that from the utility sector in that short period of time is very good. Um, and you can see the chart at the bottom shows the emissions in the, in the region. On the right is um, basically daily uh, NOx emissions through the summer season. And the top line is red, which is 2003. This is before the Midwestern and Southeastern states where, where most of the emissions are came into the system. 
And you can see how it tracked over the summer. It's highest in July and August, and it fluctuates depending on temperature, weather, et cetera. The blue line shows 2004, and it started out the first month the same because when the courts finished their litigation, no one explained to the judge that the season started May 1, and because of the date in which they resolved the case, they started it in June 1. And we said, okay, you just gave away a month <laughs> of our ozone season. And they gave the same allowances for four months that we gave for five. So essentially, it was a higher cap for that year. It was a transition year. But you can see what happened to emissions. In the month of May, they were the same as the year before. And then they turned on their SERs on, on June 1, and the emissions dropped. And then the green line is 2005, where it operated for the whole season, and it's down there. And what you see is the same fluctuations. In other words, we were not affecting sort of daily operations, but we were lowering the whole curve. And that was the point, was to lower the whole curve. Uh, tomorrow, the OTC is having one of their meetings, three meetings a year, and they're talking about how to deal with the peaks because they haven't attained all their standards. And so the issue is, is there something we can do to, to lower these peaks? We can lower the whole curve again, or we can focus on the peak. So the issue is still there, but this is a significant uh, demonstrated effect. When you look at ozone non-attainment areas in the east, on the left is, is the 2001 to 2003 air quality. On the right is 2003 to 2005. And there's been a significant drop because of that emission drop in the east. So we haven't finished, but it does work. It has reduced emissions over that area and has brought ozone levels down. Um, for all of the programs we do, um, we, we have annual reports reporting on progress, and we have tremendous amount of data on the web that many of you may know about uh, to access the information and places where everybody can go to get it. Uh, I wanted to sort of conclude with a few, some, some lessons sort of thinking over this, and there are many, many, and we could talk about it for a long time. But uh, the first question is to trade or not to trade, to have a cap and trade or not have a cap and trade. And I've worked in traditional control as long as I've worked in cap and trade and I've worked with credit trading. And, and I, I do not have a view that one tool is right for all situations, that you need to start with the problem, understand it, you need to understand the nature of the sources and you need to design a solution that works for that particular problem. And uh, it may sound obvious, but a lot of people don't do that. They just say, I, you know, I know command and control, I'm gonna apply it to every problem. Or I know trading and I'm gonna apply it to every problem. And, and that hasn't worked. Um, second thing is, can the emissions be accurately and consistently measured? And I have found that personally to be at the core of whether I'm confident and comfortable that I can, I can talk about both the environmental and the economic benefits of trading if I have accurate, complete, consistent, transparent data. If I don't, then I know I'm gonna spend a lot more resources getting that information assuring people that it's correct and they'll never be totally satisfied. So uh, my goal had always been to get over that hurdle and not have that debate or discussion. Uh, do a debatement cost differ among facilities? If they're all the same, trading doesn't matter. Uh, so you do need some differentiation. And if you don't have it in the current, there is this dynamic that, that people sometimes forget about. They design programs to deal with what I know today. And next year and five years from now and 10 years from now, the world's going to be different. The costs are going to be different. The industry costs are going to be different. Control technologies are going to change. And this program is very good at allowing people to adapt to changing circumstances because industry can just go in and put in a different control device and they don't have to come back and get a compliance plan from us. So it, it allows people the flexibility to respond quickly and that's important. Um, I don't know what the appropriate number of sources are. The more sources you have, the more robust the market. It's more of an economic issue, market power, those sorts of things. We haven't had a problem in the SO2 world. I don't know what the magic number is. Um, we work with Canada on this. Uh, they want to do cap and trade program. Uh, they only have a dozen power plants, I mean, in, in Ontario or something. So it's, it's sort of like, do they have enough to do a trading program or do they need to join with us to be part of a larger market? Uh, and th the last question is sort of, do we have the necessary governmental and market institutions? In the United States, we're very fortunate. Every time I go to other countries, that's usually the biggest problem. Th they usually don't even have good traditional regulatory systems, let alone the financial institutions and the, and the responses that, 
that this kind of a program really depends on that we did not have to create. We didn't create the brokers and we didn't create all the financial instruments that have grown out, but we have enough knowledge and capability here that those systems grew up. And then we have the SEC and the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission and we have other institutional bodies that can ensure the financial integrity of these programs. The second thing is we wanted to make sure this was compatible with existing programs. That's, that can be mean a lot of different things. Um, and, uh, and they should not undermine existing programs. They should work to complement them. Um, in general, the programs are less confusing and less expensive and more likely to succeed if they're simple. And uh, because the complexity occurs in the marketplace, not with the, with the government instructions. I find that uh, a lot of people to fix and respond to every concern and problem will build it into the regulatory structure and that just means that uh, those of us in government have to spend all our time adjudicating and resolving all these disputes and issues. If they're environmental we should be there at the table. If they're economic I, I don't see the need to be there. I don't think I add to the resolution of an economic issue and so to me the, the more we can keep it focused on the environmental concerns and, and let the financial and economic concerns sort themselves out through the other mechanisms we already have, then uh, I'm more comfortable with that. And I think that the government, is, as I've said, should stay focused on the environmental objective. And the second thing that we did was support the allowance market. And when I went through this program, there were a lot of places where we said no, there were a lot of places that we pushed for things that we wanted, there were a lot of things that we didn't get uh, that, you know, in retrospect would have helped a lot. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, w when we went through these, and, and particularly when we were developing the rules in 91, 92, 93, we, each issue that would come to us, we would say, is this going to reduce emissions? And if the answer was no, then why are we doing this? And the second question is, is this going to help or hurt the allowance market? Is this going to make it more fluid and robust and going to get the cost down and make it work better? Or is this just going to be another hurdle and another cost and it's going to have no environmental benefit? And there's, there's a tension between these two because, you know, the bottom line was the environment. That was the most important. The second thing was, can we get that environmental objective at the lowest cost and, and make sure that we get all the benefits out of, out of a market in terms of lowering costs and innovation and the things that should come with it. And uh, there were things we did not create that people asked us to do. Um, we had this debate over collecting price and said, no, we're not collecting it because we couldn't come up with a good reason to. Even though people wanted it, we said, well, you can get it from the private sector. So anytime we could turn to another institution or organization that was already doing it, we said, we're not going to get into this. And we tried to minimize the, uh, our resources and keep them focused on what we were about. Um, and uh, I mean, one thing I could tell you about in, in acid rain that, uh, that was one, the one area that cost us the most and did the least and was actually environmentally not helpful was the complexity of the phase one program in SO2 that we were stuck with because of all the political compromises that occurred. But we kept telling ourselves that it only lasted five years. And at the end of five years, we got into phase two, which was everything was simplified. But in phase one, we had a lot of trade-offs to make, and one of them was the partial inclusion of the industry. Because we were phasing it in, um, the, the agreement was reached to bring in 110 power plants that were the dirtiest plants, and we'll get reductions from them. But we knew when we did that that one of the ways they could reduce their emissions was to reduce the use of the plant and shift power to plants that were going to come in in phase two. And for five years, they would not be regulated under this program. And because of the industry that I explained earlier, this was very easy to do, but it was also very hard to track. And um, we, we came up with some of the more complex regulatory provisions of the program to try to track these electrons and find out where they went and whether people really reduced their emissions if they re uh, reduced their power plant utilization. If they did, where did the power get picked up? Which power plant picked it up? Well, there are hundreds of power plants, and you know it's instantaneously dispatched and so how are you going to do that and we came up with sort of rules of thumb that if the emissions went down the power plant had it or the utilization went down the company had to tell us where they bought the power you know I, I don't know whether we ever knew for sure 
But if, if, if you look at the emissions in this program, the phase one plants lowered their emissions. The phase two plants that were not controlled in the first five years went up two million tons by the end of that five years. Would they have gone up anyway? Would, did they go up because they shifted utilization or they didn't increase the utilization of the phase one plant like they might have but took the growth into the phase two plants? I'll never know. Uh, and there's no way to really track it and, it, and we just said it wasn't worth it because in five years we didn't have to worry about this because they'd all be in the system. And if I did it again, and you know, knowing what I know now and now everybody knowing what they know now, I think we might have been able to get an agreement to just reduce uh, the allowances for the dirtiest plants, bring all the plants in and just let them stay where they were until the phase two and then bring everybody down. And it would have had this, you know, a more controlled uh, environmental impact and I think we would have slept better knowing what was really going on in the system. Uh, because, of, because of that, we required that every plant have its monitors operating by 1994. So it wasn't a matter that they couldn't monitor. We knew what their emissions were, we just didn't know where the electrons were coming and going. So uh, for that particular industry, it was very important that the whole sector be included. Um, what I wanted to turn to is just, you know, what has happened because I think that one of the lessons I've learned, and particularly in the last few years, is that cost really does matter. In my work with the environmental community, there's often a, well, cost is not important, it's all about the emissions and, and the environmental improvement. And I agree it's about the emissions and the environmental improvement, but what I learned 20 years ago and I learned 10 years ago and I learned in the last few years is that if we reduce the cost, we have a lot easier battle dealing with getting future emission reductions. And what we did over the last three or four years was we didn't get legislation, so we went with regulations to reduce SOX and NOx by 60 to 70 percent more than we had before. And we've promulgated those rules. We're currently litigating them. We'll probably survive the litigation. And this shows the emission reductions that we have seen and will see as a result of these programs. And the, um, the benefits of getting these emission reductions, the acid rain program itself by uh, 2010 is $120 billion. That's the uh, blue line. When we get out to 2020 with these new reductions, the benefits of both these programs together will be on the order of $350 billion a year, will be more than any other federal environmental program, uh, huge. And these are fine particle benefits. 90% of them are from reductions of fine particles. So they're absolutely huge. They're absolutely fantastic from an environmental perspective. And my view is that we would not have gotten or been able to even propose these had we not demonstrated the, the cost savings from the other program. And when I showed you the chart earlier about what the cost was in 1990, that was the cost that everyone bought into. That's what we thought it was going to be, that's what industry thought it was going to be. The deal and the, and the passage of the bill was all based on that belief that we were going to spend in today's dollars seven to eight billion dollars. And instead we're spending two. And so we get this extra 70 percent reduction by spending on the order of five billion dollars per year more. And that's the difference between what we thought and what, what it actually cost. And so I look at it and say, you know, we're getting a huge environmental benefit for the same cost that we thought we were going to get in 90. So it's not costing us in terms of our going forward perception, uh, but we are getting a huge environmental benefit. And it's all because it cost less. So to me, it, that's tremendously important if we're concerned about protecting the environment. So th these are just the, the numbers of the seven to eight billion, the two and the, and the difference. So just to sum up, these are sort of the four elements that I keep coming back to as being important in running cap and trade programs. The full sector coverage, it avoids all the leakage issues and the uh, shifting of production. Uh, it, it, you get away from case by case review at who's in and who's out and reduces administrative costs. The cap is important environmentally, but it's also very important from an allowance market because when you're creating credits, you don't know what you're putting into the system and that's affecting the supply side. At least the supply here is understood and the other factors in the world will affect the price and, uh, uh, of allowances. So this helps 
um, stabilize the, the market. The monitoring is, is essential to know what's going on, again, environmentally, but also to build confidence in the, in the commodity that's being traded. If, if you don't really know what's going on, then you built in some uncertainty factor to the, to the price. And then, and then last, because of covering the full sector, capping and monitoring, we were able to provide the level of flexibility in the trading. Um, we not only allow companies to choose the compliance option, but I think more importantly over time, we allow them to change the compliance option anytime they want. Uh, because what we care about is what comes out of the stack, not what goes on the ground. Uh, and as long as, as we maintain that knowledge, it, it really opens the door to compliance flexibility, minimizing cost. And as long as we keep the source specific limits that were designed to protect local air quality, which is, uh, which is a big issue, I wasn't going to get into EJ, but that's a concern that a lot of people have. I think that if you protect local air quality through local limits and you treat these larger caps as dealing with broader regional issues and broader temporal issues, then you should be able to address avoid hot spots and avoid localized um, impacts and still allow most of the economic benefits that you get from trading. There is some restriction when you do that, but uh, I think you get most of the benefits. And the point here is not to capture every dollar of benefit, but to get the bulk of the economic savings that you can get out of this program. Thank you.